All right, here we are. I appreciate everybody being here today. Um, you should have taken the test by now, right? Yeah. Should have taken test number three over 18, 19, and the very, very first part of chapter 20, okay? You also should have done, uh, I had a connect assignment I wanted you to look through chapter 20 and then do actually before you watch this lecture, is that correct? So I hope everybody did that, okay? By the way, on Connect, I know Connect can be kind of uh, glitchy, okay? I know there's little idiosyncrasies that it has. Now, there's two ways I could handle that during the semester, okay? Is every time somebody has a little idiosyncrasy or glitch that they want me to look at, I could take the time, log in, look at it, adjust the points, analyze it, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to do that. I don't have time. I don't have the energy. So what I do is I just, at the end of the semester, I just add points. Add some, I, I give you some points at the end of the semester. And um, it will more than make up for all those little glitchy things. Okay. Now you have to also remember that um, each, each connect point is not worth like one point in the class. Okay. What I do is I take the total of all your connect points and uh, figure out the percentage that you got right and multiply that by the uh, how many ever, uh, real points I'm giving you in the class. And then that's how much you get. Okay? So every semester, though, I get emails about people who have some little glitch in it. And um, I know it can be kind of a pain in the rear, but uh, I think I bear with me on that. Okay? All right, let's talk through, um, let's take a look at chapter 20, okay? This is a really important class period, and um, I want to have you engage your brain here. Some of this stuff we've already talked about, we're going to kind of refresh ourselves. But we, we talk, we're going to talk about process cost accounting in this chapter, okay? Um, now, what we did in chapter 19, which we're done with, what we did in chapter 19 was we did job order cost accounting, right? This is for the, the production of large and unique high cost items. These items are built to order. They're not mass produced. And many, many items can be directly traced to each job, right? And the impetus for these types of uh, for this type of production is the customer order. A specific customer order has to occur, right? That was chapter 19. This is chapter 20, okay? That's what we're going to do now is process cost accounting, okay? This is used for the mass production of products that are essentially identical to each other, right? If you buy a can of Pringles, it's going to be pretty doggone similar to the can of Pringles I have, right? Okay? Um, and these items are continually produced. As a matter of fact, as we, as we sit here today, they are probably producing these, unit, these, these sorts of items that you see on this PowerPoint slide, right? Okay? And they don't wait for a specific customer order. They just manufacture these, correct? To do a little contrast between Chapter 19 and Chapter 20, let's take a look at this. In Chapter 19, as I said, it's a custom order situation, right? Whereas in, in chapter 20, it's a pro, uh, repetitive operation that they do all the time, okay? Chapter 19 products are heterogeneous. Hetero means different, right? They are different from each other, such as if you are building a custom-built house, there's no other house exactly like that in the whole world, right? It's built to your custom order. Whereas in chapter 20, they're homogeneous products. They're pretty much the same as each other, okay? There's low production volume in Chapter 19 job order systems, okay? Yeah, a construction company might make a number of houses a year, but it's not going to be like the high production volume that you see in a Chapter 20 process system, right? Like how many cans of Pringles do you think they're going to make this year? Don't even want to think about it. I don't even want to think about it either, okay? Um, okay, Chapter 19. You have high product flexibility with job order in Chapter 19, right? You can say in regards to your house, hey, we want, the, we want the carpet in the living room to look a little different than the carpet in the hallway. Or you can say we want the paint to be 
this shade or what we want the bathroom uh, knobs on our cabinets to, you know, whatever, okay? There is very low product flexibility with a process system, right? Like let's say you're dealing with this calculator. What if you told um, HP, it looks like they're the one that made that calculator, hey, is there any way I can make my, uh, all the buttons on my calculator red and blue? Because I'm a big KU fan. What would they tell you? They'd think you were crazy, right? Okay, no, this is, this, is, this is the calculator we make, all right? So there's low product flexibility in Chapter 20 process systems. Now, because there is low product flexibility in Chapter 20 process system, there are high standards. What do we mean by standards? Standards are like, um, well, take a look at that slide again. For that calculator, every calculator will have 45 buttons. They'll have one blue one, one orange one. Uh, they'll have one little screen there. They'll have, you know what I'm saying? There's a high standard. Every calculator we make has these, these standards. Well, you can't really do that with uh, Chapter 19 job order systems, can you? You can't say every house is going to have this list of materials as standards because every house is different, right? So with Chapter 19 job order systems, there's very low to medium standardization, okay? So you kind of understand the difference? Now, this is Chapter 19, and, um, and as a reminder, goods in process and work in process are the same things. When I talk about goods in process inventory and work in process inventory, those are two different terms for the exact same thing. And I'll switch back and forth, okay, without even thinking about it. So just be aware of that. But in a job order system, this is chapter 19, the goods in process account uh, consists of individual jobs, okay, like several different houses being built, right? And you've got your direct materials being uh, traced there. You have your direct labor being traced there. And then you have your factory overhead that we allocate there, right? Okay. And then we transfer it to finished goods when the job is over. And eventually we can figure out the cost for each job, correct? In chapter 19, it's very similar, okay? I'm sorry, in chapter 20, it is very similar, except the goods in process inventory account consists of specific processes, okay? Specific processes, okay? So the direct materials and the direct labor are directly traced to the process or the processes, and the factory overhead is allocated to the process, okay? Eventually, you have finished goods, and then we want to figure out the cost per unit processed, all right? There's a lot of similarities, okay? Now, more similarities. They both, uh, job order and process cost accounting, they both have the same objective. They want to determine the cost of the products. You need to know the cost of your product, right? Okay? They have the same inventory counts. Raw materials inventory, raw work in pro process inventory, and finished goods inventory. Okay? They also have the same overhead assignment method, where they take the predetermined overhead rate times some sort of actual activity. And usually, in this chapter, I think they're always using direct labor cost. Okay? Now, the journal entries, the journal entries for both job order and process costing are pretty much identical. And if you did that connect assignment for today, you saw that, right? The big difference between job order and process costing is how the cost of goods transferred to finished goods is determined, okay? It's the same journal entry when we transfer out of work in process inventory to finished goods inventory, but how we come up with these numbers is different, okay? That is the key, and that's what we're gonna work on today. Now with job order, it's very, very similar. Uh, or, or, I'm sorry, it's very, very simple, okay? Actually, show me if you can, looking at this slide. If you have a number of different houses being built, right, it's very easy to accumulate the costs to each house, right? And it's pretty much easy to determine when the house is done, right? 
the house is either not done or it's finished. It's completed, right? And there's only one job. It's, you're keeping track of one house and one job, okay? So it's pretty easy to move the costs from work in process inventory to finished goods inventory in a job order costing situation. Because think of Blake's parents' being house being built. You have all the costs on that job sheet. Is the house completed? It is now completed. All the costs on this job cost sheet, that, that's what work in process inventory is, and it's going to get moved to finished goods inventory, right? But it is a little bit more difficult with process costing, okay? What we're going to see is the cost of goods transferred to finished goods is going to equal the number of completed units times the cost per equivalent unit. The cost per equivalent unit. And that is how we'll determine the numbers that go into that journal entry. Now I introduced a new term here, equivalent unit. We're going to talk about that here in a second and for a few minutes. Okay? Um, what are equivalent units of production? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, let's understand that we do accumulate costs for a period of time, okay, either by process or department. And then we want to figure out our unit cost. Well, how do we do that in Chapter 20, Process Costing? We divide those accumulated costs by the number of equivalent units produced in the period. Okay? Now, what is an equivalent unit? Equivalent units is a concept that expresses a number of partially completed units as a smaller number of fully completed units. Okay? So what they say, they, they give you an example of two one-half full pitchers are equivalent to one full pitcher of water, right? Okay? That's pretty math, okay? Science, okay? So, 4,000 units that are 60% complete would total 2,400 equivalent units, okay? Now, they're going to give you an example in the next slide. It's not my favorite example. I have a, an example that I like better that I'll show you here in a couple minutes, okay? But let's look at the example that they have for equivalent units on the next slide. Let's say for a current period, Pencil Co., they started 15,000 units and they completed 10,000 units, okay? They completed. Those are 100% done. But there's 5,000 units that are in process and they are only 30% complete, okay? How many equivalent units of production did Pencil Company have for the period? Well, you'd have the 10,000 units that are 100% are complete, right? And if you wanted, you could take 10,000 times 100%. But then you also have the 5,000 units that are 30% complete. 30% of 5,000 is uh, 1,500, add that to the 10,000, and that equals 11,500 equivalent units. All right? Now, what is our cost per equivalent unit? Well, we take our product costs divided by those equivalent units that we calculated. For example, if Pencil Company incurred 27,600 in production costs during the period, what is the cost per equivalent unit for the period? You with me? Well, we would take 27,600 divided by the 11,500 equivalent units and we would get $2.40 per equivalent unit. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. All right. Well, let's, let's take a look at an example that I think I like a little bit better. Okay, and it goes back to this slide, all right? It goes back to this slide of the difference being how we come up with the numbers that go into this and figuring out the cost per equivalent unit. Are you with me? Okay, let me do an example real quick, okay? Let me do an example real quick. Let me switch over to the document camera. All right. 
Let's say that somebody has a lawn mowing business, okay? Let's say that somebody has a lawn mowing business. And let's say for that day, they spend $25 on gasoline, okay? And that's really the main cost. They own their lawnmower, so that's mainly the cost that they have that day. I'm making, obviously, a simple example, okay? So let's draw some lawns here. And let's say that this is all in the same uh, little cul-de-sac here, okay? So this guy gets up early, and he goes to this cul-de-sac, and there are, what, seven houses with seven lawns there, right? Okay, so let's say what he does, he has a full day, he starts early in the morning on a Saturday. He's one of these people who mows their lawns while you're trying to sleep in on a Saturday, okay? Well... He mows this complete lawn right here, okay? He mows this complete lawn right here, okay? He mows this complete lawn right here. You with me? Okay? Now, it's, it's a little bit after lunch, and he knows that these people wanted to have their lawns mowed, but he does not think that they're going to, uh, he doesn't think he's going to be able to finish all four of these remaining lawns. So what he does is instead of mowing two lawns and having them be happy with them and completely not touching these two lawns, and they're mad at him, he goes ahead and says, I'm going to mow the front lawns of all four of these houses. Are you with me? So for this house, that is one half, okay? For this house, let's say that's, uh, let's say that's two thirds, okay? My lines might be a little bit off. Okay, for this lawn, it is also one half, and for this lawn, it is two-thirds as well. Okay, are you following me, guys? Are you tracking with me? So on that day, he mowed these three lawns completely, started and completed, but on these four houses, he just mowed the front lawns near the street, okay? Well, he spent $25 in gasoline, right? He spent $25 in gasoline, okay? Now, do you see where the problem is as far as figuring out how much gasoline he spent on a lawn, okay? Because of these partially completed units. Now, come off that for a second. Do you realize, though, you don't have this problem in job order? Because you have one job. You have the costs for that one job, correct? And it's easy to know what the costs for that job are. But look at the screen. If you have $25 on gasoline and you have this situation, what do you do? Can I see your calculator there, Matt? I forgot mine. Okay. Well, let me show you what you do. You're going to figure out the equivalent units, okay? And so what we have here is we have 1, 1, 1, that's 1 plus 1 plus 1, plus a half plus a half, plus 2 thirds plus 2 thirds. You with me? So let's figure out how many equivalent units that is. That's it. Like 1, 2, 3, 4, I think that's 5 and a third, okay? five and a third equivalent units. You with me? So now what we can do is we can take that $25 divided by 5.333 equivalent units and what we will get is we'll get about $4.69 per equivalent unit. Does that make sense? And that would be helpful to know how much gas he spends on a lawn.
but you had to figure out the equivalent units. Does that make sense, guys? Okay, cool. Back to the slides. Okay, that's the lawn mowing example. That was to remind me to do the lawn mowing example, but I thought it would be nice to have a picture of a kid mowing a lawn. All right? So, enjoy that. All right? And let me tell you, when my kids mow my lawn, uh, they're not that happy. Okay? All right, to further complicate things, let's talk about the fact that Equivalent units may be different for materials versus labor and overhead, given that costs may be added at different stages of the process. For example, maybe at stage one of something being created, 40% of the materials have been added, but only 25% of the labor and overhead has been added. Okay, now usually labor and overhead always go together because overhead is allocated based on labor. Okay? At stage two, the other 60% of material is added. So after stage two, it's 100% done in regards to materials, but the other 25%, another 25% is added at stage two. So in regards to labor and overhead, it's only 50% done. You with me? And then at stage three, the last 50% of, uh, of labor and overhead is now added. So the process is now complete. Does this make sense? Okay, come off that. Um, let me give you an example. Do you remember me telling, I think I told you the, uh, the clients I worked for that put those generators on trucks and there was somebody who took one of those push carts and they picked up all the materials, right? Okay, well then let's say they delivered them to Jeremiah who was gonna be the laborer on that. Well at that point, all the materials are added to this process, right? Okay? But there hasn't been any labor done. Okay? Now I know we use that example in a job order, but, the, but, the, but it applies here too. You can see how the materials might be added before the labor. And usually the materials comes before the labor because you can't work on nothing, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to think of it as a, a job order or a process costing situation, think if you were putting these calculators th together. Okay, and I gave you like a little plastic bin that had all of the parts to put this calculator together. Well, at that point, you have 100% of the materials, right? The materials were added at the beginning of the process, but the labor hasn't been done yet. You with me? Okay. All right, cool. Let's take a look at the slides again. What I want to do is I want to work through an example exercise in your textbook, okay? Now, th there's an example in your slides, but I, just, I think I'd rather work a textbook example, okay? Now, I have handed out to everybody in this class, uh, you can come off that, something that looks like this. It says process cost summary sheets, okay? Now, what these look like, let me go to the document camera, is that is the first page and this is the second page. Okay, and you folks at home, you should have these as well. And the way that I design these for you guys is so that you can open them up and hold them side by side, because you need two pages for every problem that we do. You follow me? Okay, so what we are going to do, and I completely understand that the first time you go through this, you're gonna pretty much feel like you're just copying what I'm doing. I understand that, okay? Let's walk before we run. Okay, so follow me along in this example. But this is the example that I want to do. Um, and it, this is in your textbooks, guys. This is problem 20-4A. Uh, problem 20-4A. Problem now I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on, a little, on that a little bit if somebody doesn't have their book, okay? All right. Okay, let's read through this and we are gonna do this whole problem here in class, all right? Fast Company produces its products through a single processing department. Okay, they're making it easy for us by just having one process department. Direct materials are added at the start of production. You with me? Okay, so that is exactly the situation that I just described, Jeremiah, where they add all the materials, 100%, at the very beginning of production. 
but direct labor and overhead are added evenly throughout the process. The company uses monthly reporting periods, uses monthly reporting periods, for its weighted average process cost accounting system. Okay, this is the weighted average system that I'm going to teach you. Okay, now there's also the FIFO method, but I'm not going to teach you the FIFO method. The FIFO method is covered in your appendix, but we're only learning the weighted average method. Okay? Um, it's goods and process inventory account follows after entries for direct materials, direct labor, and overhead costs for October. So this is a T account. Now the balances are to the side. This is for goods in process inventory. Okay? Now we're going to be doing this for the month of October. All right? This is the beginning balance. This is the items added for each product cost throughout October, and that's the ending balance at the end of October. Okay? It's beginning goods in process consists of 59,450 of direct materials, 172,800 of direct labor, and 103,680 of factory overhead costs. Okay, I like to go ahead and I'm going to rewrite what they just said there. Okay, um, our beginning inventory, beginning goods in process inventory, was direct materials of. 59,450. Thank you. 5954. Is it a 450 or 540? Uh, well, I mixed it up then. Okay. 59,450, right? Um, direct labor of 172,800. Okay. And 103,680, a factory overhead. Okay, is that right? Mm -hmm. What do those numbers equal if you add them up? They equal 335, 930. That's the total, right? This is all the beginning goods in process. Okay? So this 335, 930, that is this number right here. Are you following me? Okay? That's how that number is broken down. Okay? All right. During October, the company started 140,000 units and they transferred 150,000 units to finished goods. At the end of the month, the goods in process inventory account consisted of 20,000 units. Okay? So this is how many units were in their ending inventory. And those items were 80% complete with respect to direct labor and factory overhead. Okay? You follow me? What they want us to do is prepare the company's process cost summary for October using the weighted average method. Okay. We'll have a little side note here. All right. Remember how we have done, we have done this relationship a number of times where we said, the beginning of something plus what comes in, that equals some amount, right? And that amount either becomes the end amount, like the ending inventory, or it's what leaves the process, right? Remember that? I mean, think of your, think of your uh, checking account, okay? You've got your beginning balance of cash for the month plus whatever deposits you made. That equals some sort of number, and it was either dispersed out, right, paid out, and what wasn't paid out is the end here. Is that correct? Follow me? Okay, we can do that with this goods in process um, account, okay? What we're going to have is we are going to have our beginning goods in process inventory, okay? Plus, we're going to add the cost of goods manufactured, okay? The costs incurred in this period, correct? And that is going to equal some number. Are you with me? Now, 
we have defined these two numbers for this problem. Okay? We have defined these numbers for this problem. Actually, let me get the one I was writing on. Okay? What is the beginning? Tell me if, my, if I'm not on the, on the uh, overhead, guys. What is the beginning goods in process inventory amount? What is it in total? 335, 9, 930, right? 335, 930, right? It's right here, and we know it's comprised of these three product costs, correct? And we know the items that were added this period, the costs that were incurred this period, don't we? Okay. What we can do is add these three numbers up right here. And if we add these three numbers, that equals 755170. Okay? Zoom in on that for a second. Okay? Those three numbers equal 755170. You with me? Okay? So, we know this number right here equals. Seven, five, five, one, seventy. Okay, we add those two numbers together, and they equal one zero oh, nine one one hundred, which is this number right here. Are you with me? Okay, you follow me? Okay. These are the total costs that we need to account for. Okay, and we'll be going over to that template here in a second. Now understand that some of this, some of this is going to get transferred out to finished goods inventory, right? Some amount is going to get transferred out to finished goods inventory. But there's also going to be some amount that doesn't, and thus it will be the ending inventory of goods in process, or the ending balance, I should say, the ending balance of goods in process inventory. You follow me? Now, everything that we are going to do on this template this two-page process cost summary template that I gave you, is to determine what goes here and what is transferred out. Okay? We know the total of those two numbers will equal this one. But the whole thing we're going to do is determine what was transferred out to finish goods inventory, thus we can book our journal entry, and what wasn't. Okay? And when we know this number right here, folks, we'll be able to make the journal entry where we debit finished goods inventory for something and credit goods in process inventory. Okay? Follow me? Okay? Questions? And I know this might be a little bit fuzzy, but you guys have the blessing of, if this is a little fuzzy, what can you do? You can rewatch this video. Okay? Rewatch this video. Okay, so now what we are going to do is we are going to get out our process cost summary weighted average sheet. Okay? Now, let's start going through this together. Now, we are doing problem 20-4A. So one of the first things I like you all to do is to say this is problem 20-4A, and the company, what's the company called? Fast Company? And this is for the month ended. What month are we doing? October. Tell me. October. 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 OK. The first thing that we want to do is figure out the costs charged to production. The costs charged to production. Well, we need to know of the, the cost of the beginning goods in process and the costs incurred this period. Now, didn't we say that the beginning balance of goods in process inventory was 335,930? And didn't we say that the costs incurred this period was 
755-170. And didn't we say that the total of those equaled what? We just did this. 1091-100. Okay? You with me? Now we also, we know that, we know that from our illustration we just did right here, but we also know how these numbers are comprised in regards to the individual product costs, don't we? Okay? That 335 for 930 for direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead is comprised right here, right? Where that is 59450, direct labor is 172, 800, and factory overhead is 103, 680. And you might add those three up to again to see if they equal 335930, right? We also know how this 755170 is comprised in regards to the three product costs, right? Because it's listed right there. Okay? Direct materials are 102050. Direct labor is 408200. And factory overhead is 244920. Do those three numbers equal that? Okay, cool. We have now defined this top, pro this, this top part of this equation is now in this form right here. Are you with me? Now what we have to handle is the next part. The unit cost information. Okay. The unit cost information. We're going to figure out our total units to account for and our total units accounted for. And this number that's going to go right there needs to equal that number that goes right there. Okay. Now some of these numbers they told us, they usually tell us three and we have to figure out the last one. Okay. So let's see, it's up here in this paragraph. Um, during October, the company started 140,000 units. So we'll write that there. They transferred 150,000 units. Are you with me? So that would go right here. And at the end of the month, the goods and process inventory account consisted of 20,000 units, right? So that goes right here, okay? Well, what's 150 plus 20,000? 170,000. Now, I've told you these two numbers have to equal. So this, this has to equal 170,000. So, you know, in real life, we could have figured out what the units were in beginning goods and process easily, but they didn't tell us, but we can back into the number, can't we? What is the beginning goods in process? It's 30,000. Are you with me? Cool? All right. Take a breath. Let me take a sip of my orange flavored LaCroix. Ah, refreshing. Okay. Now what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to concentrate on this information right here down into this section right here where we're going to figure out the equivalent units of production. Okay? Well, we have our units that were completed and transferred out. Correct? They are completed and transferred out. And those are 100% done. So the number of units transferred out in the equivalent units, it's the same because they're 100% done. Okay, so do you see where we write 150,000 right here for each of these product costs? Because they, if they were transferred out, they're 100% done. Okay? Now, the three product costs, though, in regards to the ending goods and process, not so fast. We know that there are 20,000 units in ending inventory of goods and process. But these were not all, for each product cost, they were not each 100% complete, right? 
Direct labor and factory overhead were only what percentage complete? 80. 80%. Now, what was direct materials? Good, Jeremiah. Direct materials were 100%. Because it says right here, direct materials are added at the start of the process. So now we can figure out our equivalent units of production for each product cost. Okay? And like I said, these have a tendency to move together because overhead is applied based on labor. Well, what's 20,000 times 100%? 20,000. 20,000. What's 20,000 times 80%? 16,000. 16,000. What is 20,000 times 80%? 16,000. 150,000 equivalent units plus 20,000 of equivalent units equals 170,000 equivalent units of production for direct materials. And if we add these numbers, that equals 166,000 equivalent units of production for both labor and overhead. You guys with me? All right. Now let's move to the next page, okay? All right. This is where we're going to go back to figuring out the costs per equivalent unit of production, okay? Well, we need to know our beginning goods and process and cost incurred this period for each product cost. Are you with me? Do we know these? Yes. Our beginning goods and process for direct material, direct labor, and factory overhead are boom, 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 right here. Is that correct? So this is 59,450. This is 172,800. And this is factory overhead in the beginning goods and process of 103,680. Is that correct? What about the costs incurred this period for the three product costs? Well, they're right here. Is that correct? So that's 102.050 for direct materials, 408.200 for direct labor, and 244.920 for factory overhead. Are you with me? Now we can add those up to get the total costs. The, this equals 161,500. Those two added together equals, um, what is that, $581,000. And those two added together equals 348,600, I believe. Are you with me? Okay. Now what we're going to do is calculate it by the equivalent units of production that we just calculated. And that's right back here. Okay? So for direct materials, what was the equivalent units of production? 170,000. 170, for direct labor? 166,000. 166, for factory overhead is also 166,000. Okay, go ahead and divide those out and figure out your cost per equivalent unit of production. Go ahead and do that on your calculators. So are these two numbers going to be equivalent? Um, hold on, I'll address that in one second. Okay. Good question, though. Okay, if you divide that by that, what do you get? 161,500 divided by 170,000 is what? 95 cents. 95. Now don't round, okay? 95 cents per equivalent unit of production. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more there. Okay. 581 divided one by 166,000 is? 350. 350 per equivalent unit. 348,600 divided by 166,000 is $2.10 per equivalent unit. Is that right? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we now have our cost per equivalent unit of production, don't we? 
So those amounts now are going to go down into this column. 95, 350, and thank you, got to move up. 95, 350, and 210. Those are now going to go down into these columns for direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. Direct materials, direct labor, and overhead. Okay? So, that's 95 cents for direct materials. 350 for direct labor. And $2.10 or factory overhead. Cool? You with me now? Okay. Now the last thing we have to do, take a look at your first page. We need to know the equivalent units of production for each product cost. Back up a little bit. We need to know the equivalent units of production for each product cost that was transferred out. And we know the, need to know the equivalent units of production for each product cost that remains in ending goods and process. So this is 150, 150, 150. Okay. And this is 2016 and 16. You with me, folks? Now we can multiply these numbers out. Okay? I'll go ahead and save you the time. 150,000 times 95 cents per equivalent unit. Uh, let me do, I'll do these all in my head. I think that's 142, 500. 150,000 times 350. I think that's 525,000. 150,000 times 210. I think that's 315,000. 20,000 times 95 cents. That's 19,000. 16,000 times 350. 56,000, 16,000 times 210, 33,600. You with me? Now we add those three numbers up. Okay, yes, I know I'm amazing. Okay. Those three numbers add up to 982,500. These three numbers add up to, let's see, what is that? I think it's 108. 600. Okay? Now, let's add these two numbers up right here. Okay? These two numbers up right here. 982,500 plus 108,600 equals 109,100. Have we seen that number before? Huh? We have. Now, if this were a sermon at church, this would be the point where I ask you to come down and give your life to God, okay? This is the apex of this whole lecture. <laughs> now, take a look at this. This is, and Aaron, we might go a, a couple minutes over, but we got to finish this, okay? The beautiful part about this, the beautiful thing is, I love when accounting has self-checking mechanisms. This is the top half of the first page. This is what we just did. And by golly, by gum, these numbers have to equal. They've got to equal. They have to equal. Okay? If they don't equal, you made a mistake. Well, take a look at this. Cost of beginning goods and process plus cost incurred this period. Oh, what? It was too high. You can okay. see. Let me see that. Let me do that again. Okay? Let's take a look at this. The costs of beginning goods and process plus the cost incurred this period are these two amounts, and that adds up to that. Okay? And that amount either is transferred out to finished goods, 
or it is not, and thus it is ending goods in process. And those two numbers equal the same number. Or if you wanted to think of it another way, that minus that equals that, or that minus that equals that. Correct? Well, if you go back to that original T account, or the, not T account, but the original equation, do we now know the numbers that go into these circles? We do, don't we? Well, how much was transferred out to finished goods? 982500. 982500. What is the remaining balance of goods in process? 600. 108600. Does that plus that equal that? No. It does. So now, do we know the number that goes into our journal entry to transfer out of goods in process inventory and into finished goods inventory? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. And what number is that? Is it the top one or is it the bottom one? 982500. It's this one right here. 982500. 982. 500. So we went through that whole process. First page, second page. We went through that whole process to know what numbers to put into that journal entry. Okay? And we analyzed it again using this. All of this was done so we would know what number would go into this entry. And sure enough, it was this number right here. Does that make sense? I know that's kind of like, that's a mouthful, is it not? Okay. But it's a lot easier with the template. And I think you're going to find that having that self-checking mechanism, knowing it needs to equal, those numbers need to equal, is going to really help you out. Okay. So if this, if this was a complicated lecture for you, you can rewatch it. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. But what I want you to do for homework, and I will let you go now, is, and you have in your packet, folks, I've given you, I think, five sets of these two-page process cost templates, okay? So just use the next one, okay? What I want you to do for homework, though, is for homework, I want you to do problem 20 dash 5a 20 dash 5a okay and it's right below the one we just did in your book okay 20 dash 5a are you with me and they had some check figures there so take a look at that okay guys whoo I know that was long thank you are there oh one thing that uh, Jeremiah asked and let me answer that real quick is going back to the one. He asked if these numbers will always be the same. Well, in, it, yes. For what you do, yes, because factory overhead is allocated based on direct labor. So if direct labor is 80% done, then factory overhead is 80% done as well because it's allocated, it's following it, right? When there's no more direct labor, there's no more allocation. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you, guys. See you later.